most beloved Christmas carol. Around the world for nearly 200 years, Christians have been singing the beloved Christmas carol, Silent Night. Here at First Christian Church, one of our most beloved traditions is the singing of this carol as we conclude our annual Christmas Eve service. Tonight we want to share with you the history of this beautiful song, how it came to be written, the times which shaped the lyrics and the music, and how the song has continued to speak hope and peace to millions around the world at Christmas. In the late 18th century, the city of Salzburg was ruled by the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. The prince, archbishops as they were known, controlled vast amounts of wealth. The city's economic engine was salt mining, and the prince, archbishops benefited greatly from it. The prince, archbishops greatly enjoyed their wealth and power, and the culture of the time went to great lengths to exaggerate the difference between themselves and the working class. One of the prince archbishops built a magnificent castle for his clandestine lover, who had borne him 12 children. The palace and its amazing gardens became a symbol of the division between the princes of the church and the common people of Salzburg. Once the Napoleonic Wars came and Salzburg was invaded and defeated, the reign of the prince archbishops was over. So was the economic engine of the salt mines. With the mines gone and the wealth of families having left Salzburg, the prince archbishops were also severely impacted, lost their wealth, and left Salzburg. This ushered in a season of economic devastation. Children, as, also were the, as always, were the ones to bear the burdens of society's ills. Children during this time often went begging door to door. The people of the town experienced ever-increasing hardships in the aftermath of the invasions and the war. And in this season of economic despair and devastation, Joseph Moore was born to a young, unmarried woman. So shameful was her situation and the birth of the so-called illegitimate son, Moore's mother was forced to pay a fee to allow her son to be baptized in the Catholic Church. A local businessman who lived in what was called Hangman's House reached out to the young woman and provided support for her and her child. Ironically, the author of the lyrics to Silent Night was himself a child for whom there was initially no room, no place to lay his head, and whose birth came about amidst society's shame. Moore's benefactor ensured that he was able to study at a good school despite the stigma on his name. The young Moore was a good student, a devout young boy who went on to become a priest in the church. His first assignment as a parish priest came at the age of 23 in a community called Marifar. Moore's first year there, 1816, was known as the Dark Year. This village was very isolated, and Moore spent a lot of time going on foot from house to house to visit and take care of his parishioners. The town faced bitter cold, and there were major crop failures, which further devastated the town's farmers. In the midst of this brutal winter, Moore contracted tuberculosis. Imagine, if you will, this committed priest ministering to the poor amid severe economic devastation, walking on foot through the countryside with tuberculosis. Legend has it that Father Moore thoroughly enjoyed a particular painting of the Nativity which hung in the local church he served. As he went about his duties, he loved to look at this particular painting in which the baby Jesus was depicted as an adorable, curly-haired, blonde baby. This baby Jesus was blessed with two adoring parents, a scene that Moore had always wanted but had never experienced. In a time when war and poverty devastated all those around him, Moore wrote these lyrics in a journal. Silent night, 
holy night. All's asleep, one so light. Just the faithful, holy pair, lovely boy child with curly hair. <laughs> Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. Silent night, holy night. God's sun laughs, oh how bright. Love from your holy lips shines clear as the dawn of salvation draws near. Jesus, Lord, with thy birth. Jesus, Lord, with your birth. Moore's message was that this baby Jesus represented hope and peace in a world filled with despair. His belief that Jesus had brought salvation and hope was real and fervent. In 1817, Moore returned to Oberndorf to take advantage of healthier air. The town eventually became part of Austria, and the economic downturn continued. Oberndorf had depended on the transportation of the salt mining industry. When the town was turned over to Austria, that trade dried up. The Salztech River was notorious for flooding, and this became a reoccurring natural disaster. The hope for peace and the salvation of a community continued to resonate with Father Moore. Unbeknownst to Moore, an important person to his future would soon arrive in Oberdorf. Franz Gruber was born the fifth child of weavers and also was shaped by growing up in a working class home. A friend of his father's paid for his training as a teacher, which led him to Ansdorf. But teaching was his, not his first love. He had been studying organ and piano. In the midst of Ansdorf sat a beautiful chapel with an organ. As a professional musician, Gruber was hired as the organist and sacristan, but he was not able to make ends meet uh, by solely working at the church. He took a job as a teacher. Normally, the teacher would be provided with a house. However, the previous sacristan's widow was still living in the house, and Gruber moved in, having no other place to live. Ultimately, he married the widow and took on her family as his own. He served this church as organist and sacristan for 21 years. Gruber taught 30 to 35 children across six grades in a one-room schoolhouse. He was highly regarded as one of the best teachers around. In this predominantly rural community, less emphasis was placed on school. Coming from a working class family, Gruber understood his students' background and their families. When Oberdorf became part of Austria, they were in need of their own parish organist, and so Franz Gruber went to live in Oberdorf, serving the parish of Joseph Moore. Both Joseph Moore and Franz Gruber were good musicians. In 1818, on Christmas Eve, Joseph Moore took the poem he wrote in 1816 and asked Gruber to set it to music. He wanted to share the song, which he hoped would give peace and comfort to his parents facing such despair and hardship. They only had a few hours. Being an excellent musician himself, Moore could certainly have written the music, so his request of Gruber indicates that he held him in high regard. Legend has it that they had to play it on a guitar because mice had damaged the organ. <laughs> Actually, the organ was already in disrepair, but Moore himself played the piece on the guitar after Gruber came up with a melody with harmonies developed by Moore. That night, they sang their new Christmas piece at the Christmas Eve Mass with Moore playing the guitar and Gruber singing with him. The song quickly became a local favorite, but Moore and Gruber fell into obscurity. Carl Moschreiber was asked to repair the organ in the parish in Oberdorf. He heard the now familiar piece and began to write it down, sharing it with local singing families who traveled about, calling it a traditional Trilillian uh, carol. In 1854, 
the Royal Prussian Court sent a note to Benedictine Abbey in London inquiring as to the author of the song. Surely it was an English song, they thought. <laughs> Gruber's son, Felix, became aware of the inquiry about the song and told his father. Franz Gruber then set about to write down an official account of the writing of Silent Night. Moore had wanted to offer hope to his people and offer praise to God. Sadly, Moore died in 1848 of lung disease. Gruber, however, Gruber, however, <coughs> accurately portrayed Moore's wish that the song would endanger hope and peace for the world, the hope and peace, peace found in the Lord Jesus. One of the most powerful testaments to this hope and peace offered by Silent Night happened during World War I. It's a wonderful story of how the hope for peace can transcend even the most bitterly drawn barriers. Christmas Day, 1914. Dear Mother, My darling Meg, my good friend Charles. My dear sister Janet. It's two o'clock in the morning, and most of our men are asleep in their dugouts. Yet I could not sleep myself before writing to you of the wonderful events of Christmas Eve. In truth, what happened seems almost like a fairy tale, and if I hadn't been through it myself, I would scarce believe it. Just imagine. While you and the family sang carols before the fire there in London, I did the same with enemy soldiers here on the battlefields of France. As I wrote before, there has been little serious fighting of late. The first battles of the war left so many dead that both sides have held back until replacements could come from home. So we have mostly <coughs> stayed in our trenches and waited. But what a terrible waiting it has been, knowing that any moment an artillery shell might land and explode beside us in the trench, killing or maiming several men. And in daylight, not daring to lift our heads above ground for fear of a sniper's bullet. And the rain. It has fallen almost daily. Of course, it collects right in the trenches, where we must bail it out with pots and pans, and with the rain has come mud, a good foot or more deep. It splatters and cakes everything, and constantly sucks at our boots. One new recruit got his feet stuck in it, and then his hands too when he tried to get out, just like in that American story of the tar baby. <clears throat> Through all this, we couldn't help feeling curious about the German soldiers across the way. After all, they faced the same danger as we did, and they slogged about in the same muck. And what's more, their first trench was only 50 yards from ours. Between us lay no man's land, bordered on both sides by barbed wire. Yet they were close enough, we sometimes heard their voices. Of course, we hated them whenever they killed our friends, but other times we joked about them and almost felt we had something in common. And now it seems they felt the same. Just yesterday morning, Christmas Eve day, we had our first good freeze. Cold as we were, we welcomed it because at least the mud froze solid. Everything was tinged white with frost, while a bright sun shone over all. Perfect Christmas weather. During the day, there was little shelling or rifle fire from either side, and as darkness fell on our Christmas Eve, the shooting stopped entirely. Our first complete silence in months. We hoped it might promise a peaceful holiday, but we didn't count on it. We've been told the Germans might attack and try to catch us off guard. <coughs> I went to the dugout to rest, and lying on my cot, I must have drifted asleep. 
All at once, my friend was shaking me awake, saying, come here and see. See what the Germans are doing. I grabbed my rifle, stumbled into the trench, and stuck my head cautiously above the sandbags. I never hoped to see a stranger and more lovely sight. Clusters of tiny lights were shining all along the German line, left and right, as far as the eye could see. What is it? I asked in bewilderment, and someone answered, Christmas trees. And so it was. The Germans had placed Christmas trees in front of their trenches, lit by candle or lantern, like beacons <coughs> of goodwill. And then we heard their voices, rain <coughs> and song, still enough. rise from the trench, climb over their barbed wire, and advance 
unprotected across no man's land. One of them called, send officer to talk. I saw one of our men lift his rifle to be ready, and no, and no doubt others did the same. But our captain called out, hold your fire. Then he climbed out and went over to meet the Germans halfway. We heard them talking, and a few minutes later, the captain came back with a German cigar in his mouth. <coughs> We've agreed there will be no shooting before midnight tomorrow, he announced. But sentries are to remain on duty, and the rest of you stay alert. Across the way, we could make out groups of two or three men starting out of the trenches and coming toward us. Then some of us were climbing out, too, and in minutes more. Then we were in no man's land, over a hundred soldiers and officers of each side, shaking hands with men we'd been trying to kill just hours earlier. Before long, a bonfire was built, and around it we mingled, British khaki and German gray. I must say, the Germans were the better dressed, with fresh <laughs> uniforms for the holidays. <laughs> Only a couple of our men knew German, but more of the Germans knew English. I asked one of them why that was. Because many have worked in England, he said. Before all this, I was a waiter at the Hotel Cecil. Perhaps I waited on your table. Perhaps you did, I said, laughing. One German told me he had a girlfriend in London <coughs> and that the war had interrupted their plans for marriage. I told him, don't worry, we'll have you beat by Easter, then you can come back and marry the girl. <laughs> he laughed at that. Then he asked if I'd send a postcard he'd give, he'd give me later, and I promised I would. Another German had been a porter at Victoria Station. He showed me a picture of his family back in Munich. His eldest sister was so lovely, I said I should like to meet her someday. He beamed and said he would like that very much and gave me his family's address. Even those who could not converse could still exchange gifts. Our cigarettes for their cigars, our tea for their coffee, our corned beef for their sausage, badges and buttons from uniforms changed owners, and one of our lads walked off with the infamous spice, spiked helmet. I myself traded the jackknife for a leather equipment belt, a fine souvenir to show when I got home. Newspapers, too, changed hands, and the Germans howled with laughter at ours. They assured us that France was finished and Russia nearly beaten, too. <laughs> We told them that was nonsense. One of them said, well, you believe your newspapers and we'll believe ours. Mm -hmm. Clearly, they were lied to. Yet, after meeting these men, I wonder how truthful our own newspapers have been. These are not the savage barbarians we've read so much about. They are men with homes and families, hopes and fears, principles, and, yes, love of country. In other words, men like ourselves. Why are we led to believe other ones? As it grew late, a few more songs were, tra were traded around the fire, and then all joined in for, and I'm not lying to you, old Lang Syne. <coughs> we parted with promises to meet again tomorrow, and even some talk of a football match. I was just starting back to the trenches when an older German clutched my arm. My God, he said, why can we not have peace and all go home? I told him gently, that you must ask your uncle. He looked at me then, searchingly, perhaps my friend, but also we must ask our hearts. Dear wife. Dear friend. Tell me, has there ever been such a Christmas Eve in all history? And what does it all mean, this impossible befriending of enemies? For the fight here, of course, <coughs> It means regrettably little. Decent fellows, those soldiers are <coughs> need, but they follow orders, and we do the same. Besides, we are here to stop their army and send it home, and never could be sure of that duty. Still, one could not help imagine what would happen if the spirit shown here were caught by the nations of the world. Of course, disputes must always arise. But what if our leaders were to offer well wishes in place of warnings? Songs in place of slurs? Presents in place of reprisals? Would not all war end at once? 
All nations say they want peace. Yet on this Christmas morning, I wonder if we would want it quite enough. Yours truly, yours always. Sincerely. With all my love, John. Andrew. Philip. Tom. villages near Oberndorf began to institutionalize the tradition of Silent Night. There are Silent Night villages, a Silent Night museum, and society. In 1998, Elizabeth Krakauer visited the Silent Night Society where she saw a score written by Gruber. It reminded her of the one she had at home, which her family had owned for years. As it turned out, the score was actually the first written by Moore in 1822. This score provided the first confirmation of Moore's authorship. Moore's prayer was that Silent Night would serve as a way for his people to be reminded of the hope and peace that comes through Jesus Christ. Moore's language is visionary, and something in these words has clearly resonated around the world for nearly 200 years. A song that stilled the gums of war at Christmas. A song that calms our hearts and spirits. A song that invites us to remember the baby in the manger, whom the prophet Isaiah declared would be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, the Prince of Peace. Every time we sing Silent Night, we are declaring <coughs> God's hope for the world and affirming Joseph Moore's belief in the power of song to instill in us a powerful hope every time we sing it. Well, that's the story of the song, Silent Night. And as Joseph Moore, in his time, experienced devastation and economic uh, despair, he simply wanted a way for people who had nothing and faced difficult situations to be reminded of the fact that the baby Jesus was born as a reflection of God's love and as a sign of God's promise for us all. If we can still the guns of war, if we can put aside all of our differences, if we can look at each other as human beings, then hopefully peace may truly come on earth. We live in a world where terrorism and bigotry and fear threaten to tear our world apart. I hope that tonight, as we sing Silent Night, we'll remember how strong that hope can be in Jesus Christ. Regardless of the religion that we ascribe to, as Christians, we believe that all are created by God and therefore all are worthy of dignity and respect, and we're called to live out that love. As you sing tonight, I hope your heart will be filled with peace, that you'll not only sleep in heaven with peace like the baby Jesus, but that you'll awaken tomorrow, committed to be sure that the light of God's love will always shine through you. As we light our candles, we're going to sing tonight. We'll sing the three verses. Franz Gruber and uh, Joseph Moore sang it with the guitar, and our own Dan Johns is going to help us uh, with that tonight. We'll pass the light from person to person. As we end the song, Feel free to leave. There will be no formal benediction. This is our benediction. As you leave, my family and I have a little token for you. So stop and say hello to Walter and Mitchell at the door as you leave. Sleep in heavenly peace. May the light of God's love and the comfort and the warmth of the peace that only God can give be <coughs> this Christmas season. Mm -hmm. 